Hi. Hi. Okay. Where's my slide? I think about computing a lot. Um, and I doubt most of you do uh, nearly as much, and I hope so. I hope not. And whether you do or not, whether you care about computing, it's part of your life. It's insidiously found its way into your life. I bet most of you today have a computer on your body. You're wearing one. There's one in your purse. Hopefully you shut it down so it's quiet. Um, it's clearly part of everything we're doing. I want to talk about a, a, what I think is a really phenomenal shift in how we think about it, what's happening to our computing experience. That device in your pocket, as advanced as it is, is really kind of born out of this, this experience. It hadn't changed a whole lot. Even though the technology's gotten a lot better, the experience itself, I mean, that's my focus. Not the low-level technology, but how we as a society experience what computing does to our lives. It hadn't changed. Even the most modern expression of it still basically follows that mode of having to leave the life we live, to leave that and step in and use this device in its own modal context. This Tron, you remember this movie? To me, this is a, a, this is a great movie that sort of sums up how computing is in that m mindset. You go to it. In this, in this fantasy, we go literally into the computer. And that was, for a long time, the sort of the most fantastic expression of this expression, uh, this idea around computing. I want to show you another example, something that I'm going to try and set up an argument for how this is shifting in front of us, a very radical shift. This is from the movie Strange Days. And so I'm going to let you watch this very short clip, and I'm going to try and argue why this is more the future we're facing. This is life. It's a piece of somebody's life. It's pure and uncut, straight from the cerebral cortex. I mean, you're there, you're doing it, you're seeing it, you're hearing it, you're feeling it. What kind of things, exactly? Exactly anything. It's whatever you want, whoever you want to be, okay? I mean, if you want to go ski without leaving your den, you can. But I'm assuming that a guy like you, you want to go skiing, you fly to Aspen. It's not what you're interested in here. It's, uh, it's about the stuff that you can't have, right? The forbidden fruit, hmm? See, I can get you what you want. I can, I can get you anything. You just have to talk to me, you have to trust me, okay? Trust me, because I'm, I'm your priest. I'm, I'm your shrink. I am your main connection to the, to the uh, switchboard of the souls. I'm the magic man. Santa Claus is the subconscious. You say it. You think it. You can have it. Santa Claus of the subconscious. I love that. So maybe that's intriguing. That is an idea about where computing's going. Let me try and untangle that. I'm going to give you a few set of ideas, five different ideas. And to this sense, uh, this quote you're probably familiar with, hopefully you are. William Gibson, a lot of these things are happening right in front of you. So I'm not going to show you necessarily things that are distant, unbelievable technologies, but phenomena that are happening to us right now. Yet we haven't seen it all add up to what I think is a radical shift, something perhaps as big as the introduction of the internet to ourselves, to our society uh, has been. The first one, the product itself is changing. In other words, the things we use to access the experience I'm talking about. This is a toaster. Yeah, duh. Um, but this is emblematic of the design challenge. A toaster is self-evident for the most part. You could almost take a space alien or a, a monkey or something, and it would be able to approach this device and get an idea about what it's for, what it does. The design challenge is largely solving the affordances that, uh, require, that are required of its operation. It has slots. It has levers. That's how designers approach building toasters. The same thought process gets us to computers. We need a keyboard, we need screens. These sort of things drive the design of this device. The human body is a certain shape, and screens and, and, and input means 
force that design. It's, in other words, its functionality is largely evident as you look at it. The same thing with the historical telephone. But what about phones now? These little things, this one's really little, we, we, can, we can still say, even though it's pretty radical, we can still say that's a phone, right? But something funny is happening to it. Even though we still call it a phone, we did, uh, it's doing all kinds of crazy things that really aren't, have nothing to do with telephony. That, you know, that as a, a, so all of the shape, all of the signals that we get from looking at it aren't about telephony. They're alarm clock, music, and all of the origin of those functions, all of the sort of the signals about how we learned to do those various other functions come from other seeds, other design origins, other forms, other interaction rule sets and, and, and mental models of thinking. The device itself, in front of us in the last few years, has reduced itself from something we could understand by looking at it to something that tells no story. And we're seeing that not only happen, but a convergence of devices that each mean something different and are becoming now new things that are, we're not sure what to call them. And we've got shorthands for them now. These are, I think, temporary uh, scripts. We call them computers, maybe. Uh, do we call this a computer? I, I think we maybe could call it a window instead. What's interesting is the object's losing its functional clarity, and these things can be whatever we want them to be. They are a phone at one point, a game machine at one point, a business terminal at one point. So the second phenomena, people are living two lives. The first life, this is the fleshy interaction that we're having now. I'm here talking to you. We can see each other. We know each other. The second phenomena, it's interesting. It's actually very old. We could write each other letters uh, hundreds of years ago even and create a second persona of ourselves. We could be more serious. We could be funny when our first life expression, our relationships were very different. But what's interesting about this is our second life is growing in fidelity and uh, uh, frequency to the point where it's competing with that first life. In fact, some people consider their relationships in the second life with other people more real than they would many first life relationships. That's an interesting phenomena. And they are getting tangled up. They are no longer separate ideas. They are things where we could meet someone and look them up within seconds and then all of a sudden know a whole lot more and be able to interact with them in a whole other way. This is a commercial. I'm going to show. Oh. Okay, I kind of blew my... Watch it and I'll tell you about it. I thought you were too good to be true. My cup of love was overflowing. I knew the stranger in the crowd and I would be strangers no more. Beautiful commercial in that it, everything I just said there, they sort of roll that up in 30 seconds. Really very clever, um, and especially from someone like Coca-Cola. Uh, a third phenomenon, this is probably the part that's most dear to me, is the human interface is making giant leaps in front of us. Touch, which is really a recent thing to get across to consumers on a widespread basis, is in the, really the important first step. It, what's important about it is we're familiar with touch. We've been doing that for 60 million odd years. We get it when we touch a thing and it does something in reaction to that. Um, computing largely before then is moving one thing over here and seeing a little dot move around over there. And we had to learn those abstractions and pile upon pile of abstractions you had to memorize and understand. Touch is interesting because you see the button, you push the button. Um, but even perhaps more profound in terms of where this is going is 3D. Not 3D pictures, but actually talking to the computer in three-dimensional space. We understand three-dimensional space. We are born and to live in that. But a computer doesn't understand that. It doesn't see us in space. For a computer to start to understand three-dimensional components of our world is a big, big leap. And this has long legs. But even more so, the computer is learning to interact with our world. 
Basically, it can see us. It is, we are teaching it progressively today to learn to teach it to see us and track us and interact with us in very creative ways. This, of course, is a humorous. Uh, you'll see what he does here. Is when the computer knows exactly what we're doing, it can do some pretty funny things. Totally trivial example, but you can imagine, hopefully, where this goes. Hal. Hal, obviously, created in the late 60s. Um, and besides his intelli the intelligence of that character in the movie 2001, Hal was interesting in that it represented a computing experience where we talked to this computer as we did what we did. We didn't go to a console and sit down and talk and type at it, or even sitting at a console and talk, talking. It, the computer was around us. How was the ship? We were in how, in essence. That's a phenomenal uh, bridge. I want you to look. This is a technology from Microsoft that is going to come out this year, and well, hopefully this year if they get it done. Maybe some people know a little more. Um, where the computer can actually see us and interact with us as we're in our world. This is a big leap. Watch what happens here. Right, I'm going to do a body, and a tail, a big fin, and a smiley face. There we go. What do you think? So she drew a picture, and she just handed it up. Now, what was really happening is the camera took a snapshot of that piece of paper, which was just like a scan, really kind of a cheat. But the computer knew the paper was coming up and knew when to take the picture because it could not only see color, as uh, computers and cameras can to today, but it could see shape. And if you can see shape, you can pick out rectangles and things like that and make sense of that. So what I'm telling you, if you're not into all the geeky technical side of this, is the computer's able to understand not only what they see, but not only being able to see, but actually understand what they see. This is happening, and this is going to be a video game add-on, not a giant supercomputer over in uh, somebody's special lab. Remember After Dark? A few of you guys. <laughs> it's kind of fun, because there are people toying around with the implications of just trivialities. And computing interacts with our space. This is something that could occur if we're able to overlay successfully in casual context. Not, not for serious purposes, but walking along the street, just decorating our world making it just a little more lively and interesting, if it, as if it's not already. Um, this was pre-rendered, but this is the kind of thing that we can imagine would be possible. <laughs> this is actually just a student did this. So keeping time, sorry. Um, one of the most interesting things happening, uh, uh, a little bit out of Microsoft Research, a little bit out of some, some, some universities, is this idea of using what we do for, in normal daily activity. This is uh, where in the city, uh, Dubrovnik, everybody's taking pictures. They're on vacation, they're walking around taking pictures, and all those pictures they share on Flickr and, and personal websites. Well, by taking all of those pictures and piling them into a computer, it's able to look at all the different images, which represent lots of overlap, right? If, if we all take a picture of that famous tower, then, and we take a picture of our friends standing in front of the tower, we can match up all those pictures and come up with the shape that is the city. In other words, it can tell that that tower reoccurs, and there's the other side of the tower, and we can make sense of the shape of the city and actually map the physical entity that is that city that one walks around, and then use that to re-enter maybe in virtual context. So real picture taking becomes computer information, which yet again becomes a real possibility to walk around it, even if we're not there. Pretty wild stuff. Another example of that, this broader idea of our world being captured, searched, correlated, and powering our world again comes in, in things like like.com, where we see we can give it a picture, and it can show us 100 options of similar products to buy. And oh my god, I'm running out of time. Uh, so we're going to skip that one. <laughs> computing experience is no longer tied to devices. Um, I always say the problem with computing is it still requires computers. Oh, I showed you this picture, special skills, special places. It's still kind of a thing we go to. Even today, we have to sit down and use the box. And, but we're seeing this phenomenon happening where we can do things in and around the world. 
we tag our world. This is, you know, street art tagging, but there's also tagging in the sense of the exit sign out there. We annotate the world around us. But that density is usually only in service of the world that we get to understand. But look at a case like this. This is Cannon Beach in Oregon. And that's the real space, right? But you look at here, this is uh, some, some basic uh, government information, the, those city mapping, so the infrastructure being mapped out. The businesses have mapped uh, 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 things for you to know. And we as citizens get to make little notes about what we like about that space. What's interesting is the density of that information, whoop, there, back, is in a lot of ways more interesting to us, can become, is becoming more interesting to us than the physical space. It's, it's an interesting challenge. We imagine this uh, device where we might literally tag our world, literally spray paint uh, on top of the world around us. So kind of a swirl of things happening. Our spaces are becoming the computer, even at scale. A world is becoming a computer. In other words, all of these sensors around us, these things are adding to what that means to ex our things are becoming the computer. We are becoming the computer. If you look at Thursday, the plane crashed. The information coming from us collectively, sort of the collective computer in that case, was much more valid and much more interesting within minutes than what the people anointed to be the authorities and, and broadcast news could come up with within hours. That's that example right there. Lastly, we are becoming a computer. It's a way of describing this as the experience is turning inside out. So my last chapter here. And I'm, body becomes node, peripheral, and the interface itself. Look at these guys, the Borg, 1995, well ahead of their time. We kind of look at them when we laugh. <laughs> and you laugh, but look, this guy used to be, we called him a douchebag when he first came out. I did. <laughs> But we've come a little used to this, right? Look at that. The, they're still a little bit objectionable. But you look at how we become, we accept these things. And so if, if I render, if I show you an image like this, is that acceptable? Fashion gets us there. This is the mechanism that sort of insinuates giant change like this into society. So if I show you again an image that maybe is shocking, we could argue that it becomes acceptable whether that one does or not. How does this happen? It happens very progressively. Computer first becomes part of our lives. We expect to have one, to be near one at some point. We then learn to bring it with us. You've got them in your pockets. We then learn to see through them. We can use them to annotate our world literally on the world, not simply off to the side. They become honest then. And then they, you know, look at this. This is a product coming out. Uh, and then lastly, the computers become us. Which leads me to my last provocative question. They're staring at me for get done. Uh, would you give away an eye to have it replaced with a camera? I know your first answer is no. This guy had to. or he, did, he lost his eye, and so he chose to put a camera in one of his eyes that simply just recorded his life. Rob Spence. We are exploring at a scientific level, not Frog, but others, um, the idea of wearing such an appliance. Microsoft, is it playing? It's not playing. OK, skip it. Um, there are mass market examples, the idea of having the information about what the body is doing with you, on you. We're re recording where we're going. We're broadcasting our locations. We are essentially becoming computing nodes at that point. Even video games are getting in on the act where what the body is saying is becoming part of that. Even at Frog, we've explored four companies' ways of attaching sensors so that the computer is reporting on what your body is doing. So it raises this question of what happens when this, these devices become, they become part of the conversation. They almost become like Twitter feeds. Um, in Iron Man, in the comic book and in the movie, he says, I can see through satellites now. We know how that feels, right? Yes, you do. This is where we are today. We can see through satellites. We can't quite do it with our eyes yet. We can just nearly do it, which raises the question again, how quickly is an augmented reality, promise, 
leading us to feel the need or the desire for an augmented body. Or in other words, as I asked, would you give up an eye to see through satellites? Thank you.